to uh, provide a like, significant role in the treatment system in Vietnam. And for the social affairs, um, we now, uh, beside the compulsory treatment, we, they also provide the uh, voluntary uh, treatment for patients. And some of the rehabilitation centers, they also provide the methadone uh, at the center. And the justice system has uh, recently come to the uh, treatment system in Vietnam and we uh, have uh, pilot the drug court uh, for a couple of years and with the teenagers uh, who are using drugs. And beside the main system, uh, we have the involvement of family, the peer, the social services, and the other sector from the health services. And for the mapping services nationwide, as I mentioned previously, we have different facilities in Vietnam. We have the medication treatment, uh, we have the rehabilitation center, we have psychiatric hospital and clinic. And um, nationwide, we have, uh, now we have more than 340 uh, methadone clinic, and uh, uh, we have uh, seven provinces uh, that pilot the buprenorphine treatment and we have more than 100 uh, rehabilitation centers. And below on the right hand side, you can see uh, a, a picture of the methadone clinic. The patients are in line to get their methadone dose and a picture of the uh, rehabilitation center. And on the left hand side here, a map of the services uh, in Vietnam. The purple one uh, are the MNT clinic and the pink one are the rehabilitation center. So we have kind of um, of a picture of how they distribute in different regions in Vietnam. And in terms of type of services, uh, most facilities, uh, they provide the drug addiction counseling uh, and psychosocial support, while only a like, few of them provide the um, ATS use or alcohol use disorder treatment. And we are working with the ITT network uh, to uh, develop the, an online map of the uh, facility for Vietnam. Uh, for indeed, uh, website you can search by provinces uh, by the facility name, and uh, you can find the address of uh, a facility as well as the services that they provide. And uh, I think that is a good uh, resources for information, and we will share with you when uh, it is ready to share. And then next, uh, I will talk about the current workforce of Vietnam. We done a survey, national survey in 2021 and 2022 in seven provinces that have the highest number of people who use drugs and people who living with HIV in Vietnam from both region, the north, the center, and the south of Vietnam. And the participants are the staff working at the MNT clinic under the Center for Disease Control and Prevention belong to the um, Ministry of Health. Uh, participants working for the uh, rehabilitation center under the social affairs system and the staff working in the private organization and most of them are the faith-based uh, religious organization. And in total, we have more than 800 participants uh, from the three systems. And, um, but uh, for the on the north, the center, and the south. But unfortunately, at uh, that time, we have the COVID-19, so uh, some provinces, they are less that participant compared to others. Um, so we hope that in the future uh, survey, we can have like, more uh, representative uh, participant. And we collect information, uh, including the social demographic characteristic, the training background, as well as their training needs. And for the demographic characteristic, uh, we see the difference between the staff working in different systems. Uh, for example, for the gender, you can see the lower on the left. Uh, the CDC one is the staff working uh, for the health, Medici of Health. Uh, they are more female compared to the two other systems. And they also have, uh, seem to have higher education level uh, compared to the two other. And for the private organization, most of them have uh, below intermediate or intermediate uh, education level, um, as uh, most of them are the peer worker with a history of drug use in the past. And in terms of their specialized training, um, the staff working for the social affairs system, they have a variety of uh, training background. Some of them have the uh, financial or even law 
uh, background uh, before work for the system. And uh, about 70% uh, of the physicians working in the system, they have a practicing license. And uh, the special specialty that they have, they can have a preventive medicine, uh, internist, uh, general practitioner, and only few of them have a, a psychiatrist um, as their uh, specialty for the practicing license. And on average, um, staff have about nine years of working in the addiction field. And the staff working in the uh, health field, they have a pretty lower number of uh, years of uh, working in the field as the result of the high turnover in the system. And we asked them about their training experience in the past two years, uh, participation in certified training course and the lecture. Uh, so uh, about half of participants, they have experience attend in this training in the past two years. Uh, but for the private organization, only about like less than 10% of them had attend in the certified training courses. And the frequent uh, use knowledge and skill are different for uh, their position um, according to their tasks in the system. Uh, but we see that the treatment adherence support is the common uh, skill that they use in their work uh, is uh, reasonable as uh, addiction is a chronic disease that they have to uh, support the addiction, uh, the adherence for patient. And for the preferred uh, training topics, uh, it's also different uh, com between the manager, the physician, the nurse, uh, pharmacist, and counselor. Those uh, are in red that I highlight uh, are the ones that have like more than 80% of participants, they um, mentioned that they prefer the topic. And the common topic that uh, they prefer are uh, about the new psychoactive substance and depends on their uh, job, uh, like the physician, they prefer to learn more about the mental health disorder screening. Uh, the counselor, they prefer the motivational interviewing, uh, the strategy to reduce uh, substance use and HIV stigma, and the ethics in addiction uh, treatment. In terms of the training formats, uh, most participants, they prefer the on-site and online training. And uh, they emphasize that they want the training to be on the evidence-based intervention, um, the intensive training, and spend more time uh, for practice, uh, not only uh, theory. However, there are also barriers to attend the training. The most common barriers is about the high workload that affect the motivation to attend the training of the staff, uh, limited budgets that does not allow most staff to attend the training. And the last but not least, uh, we think that it's very important that too little reward to change the current system procedure. That means that after they have the, uh, attend the training, they know that something can be very effective, but uh, they have no motivation to apply uh, that new knowledge and skill uh, to the system. So in conclusion, I have some uh, key messages um, for, for further suggestion for the training and intervention. Uh, the methadone clinics and the rehabilitation centers are the two most common uh, facilities for drug intervention in Vietnam. And although uh, we may all agree that the private services are very um, needed, but the educational level attainment and also the continuing training uh, they're much lower compared to the medical and the social affairs system. And the participant training needs, uh, they, the topic is about the new psychoactive substance, the mental health disorder, the evidence-based intervention, such as motivational interviewing. And the, uh, there are different barriers uh, for attending future training, and um, especially no time for training, the limited resources and limit uh, rewards to improve the quality of the current treatment. And we hope that uh, with this forum and the support, continued support from ITC Network and ICUDDR, we have more chance to develop and improve the uh, professionalization of the drug treatment in Vietnam. Thank you. And we do have time for questions, if there are any questions for Dr. Ziet.
I will start things off with a question then, to maybe have an icebreaker here. Um, you had a slide that showed what people um, wanted and didn't want in training, and I noticed for evidence-based practice, uh, I think the number was 73%. D does that mean that there are 27% um, who want to be trained in non-evidence-based things? <laughs> I think every, everyone agree that it's not that um, answer, but we have the, the, the training that now we, uh, the format of the question we list on the topic uh, for participants to choose um, the degree of agree, agreement that they want to get training for that. And for the evidence-based intervention, so 70% think that they very agree to, to have that kind of training. Let me uh, bring a microphone here, and if you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Christiana from Indonesia. So um, that's very nice and amazing uh, presentation. I would like to ask you uh, did many training uh, for uh, professional uh, for addiction cases. Uh, we did also in our country, but uh, the challenges uh, are the turning over of the professional who work in addiction is very fast. When you do the training now, and then the six months later, he will move to the other section. So we will start again the training from the zero. How do you handle uh, that kind of challenge? Because your system, I think it's uh, better from um, my university, maybe not nationally. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your, your question. So um, in my uh, results, so we have the two main systems, the social affairs system and the healthcare system. And the turnover is much higher in the healthcare system. Uh, in the social affairs, so, uh, it's, most of them are the, the public uh, center, so they have a, a permanent position in those centers, so they have uh, lower turnover compared to the methadone clinic. Especially in the past, when we have many um, international organizations, they fund for the position in the MNT clinic. And after they end the funding, so now the government have to find a, a new position, new person uh, for that uh, to replace uh, the staff that previously be paid by the international organization. And when we have a new, we have a kind of the survey, um, the MOH, they send a survey for, uh, for the system, provincial system, and when they have a new staff, uh, the clinic, they make a list and send to the uh, Ministry of Health that they request, they have those number of staff uh, and need training. And when they have a certain number of, of, of new staff, so they can organize training for them. And we are um, also the, the organization who provide training for the new staff uh, in the methadone treatment uh, system. Yeah. So we have continuing training. We have training for, for new staff and also the, um, the advanced training for people who currently work in the field. Let's take one more question before we move to the next speaker. Hi. Thanks, it, it was a great presentation. I, I was struck by the, the comment that referenced um, no motivation for making improvements, no, no reward, no, can you, can you say more about that or say what, what would be the levers to change that? What would be the focal points for that to be different? Or, or can you just talk about what your understanding is of, of that phenomenon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a tough question. Like, um, so um, in, in the system, um, it's phenomenal is because the, the, patient, the staff, they get payment, uh, but the payment is not based on the um, it's not uh, based on the successful of the treatment, 
for example, if they have like extra payment to, uh, if they have more adherent patient adherent to the treatment, or more patient come to the clinic, they could have more motivation to apply the uh, knowledge and skill to improve the treatment quality. But their payment is not is very, um, it's not it's not a, yeah, it's not related much to the quality of the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Jia, for your presentation and answering questions. It's amazing. Thank you. You, you know, 15 years ago, there was, was nothing in Vietnam related to uh, treatment institutions or training pathways, and they've done so much in, in the last 15 years. So congratulations to the Vietnam team working under such challenges of creating a system. Our, our next speaker had a system of education and training for a long time, but has faced other challenges, the disruption of that by war. And so we'll hear from Dr. Irina Pinchuk, a psychiatrist, an ICU DDR board member, and a professor of psychiatry at the uh, Tras uh, Shevchenko National University in Kiev, to talk about some of those challenges of continuing training uh, during wartime. Dr. Pinchuk. Kevin, for uh, my introduction, uh, dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity uh, uh, to tell uh, about our activities. Uh, first of all, some words about ITTC Ukraine. ITTC Ukraine uh, uh, was established in 2022 and uh, uh, is hosted uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry at Rashevchenko National University, which uh, is the uh, biggest university in uh, Ukraine with uh, more than 32,000 students uh, and uh, works in partnership uh, with the uh, University in California, San Diego, uh, USA. In my presentation uh, today, uh, I uh, would like uh, to tell some words about the current situation in Ukraine, uh, addiction uh, services uh, provision after a year of war in Ukraine, and uh, uh, about our prospection. Uh, situation, current situation in Ukraine. Uh, this is um, uh, March uh, 2022, railway station uh, in Kiev. Uh, only women with uh, children could uh, live. And uh, now more than uh, 22 million people were forced to leave their homes uh, during Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, according uh, uh, to a national study conducted uh, uh, by the International Organization for Migration, uh, more than uh, 32 million uh, Ukrainians were affected directly or uh, indirectly, and uh, uh, more than uh, 15 and a half uh, Ukrainian million families experienced uh, worsening of uh, mental uh, health. Uh, last uh, year, 2022, uh, there were about uh, 300 attacks uh, that damaged uh, or destroyed 219 hospitals and clinics. Uh, before the war, there were uh, 61 uh, psychiatric uh, hospitals uh, in Ukraine. Uh, 10 hospital uh, uh, psychiatric were destroyed and uh, six of uh, uh, them completely destroyed and they cannot be destroyed. Uh, the addiction uh, uh, facilities uh, um, are part of the psychiatric hospital in our country. Uh, this is uh, to a published article about uh, the um, 
mental health and addiction services uh, um, in Ukraine during the war. Um, uh, the mental health services uh, structure uh, in Ukraine has, be, uh, has been uh, severely damaged. A shortage mental health facility across uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, we uh, provide uh, um, uh, study uh, 32 um, director of uh, mental health uh, hospitals um, and uh, uh, we decide the result that um, uh, hospital admissions uh, were reduced by uh, 23 and half percent during the war uh, April 2022 uh, compared uh, with uh, before the war January 2022. Uh, facilities uh, reported uh, reduction in staff with 9% uh, of total medical workers uh, displaced and uh, half percent injured across facilities. Uh, one facility reported uh, that 45 and half and half percent of their total medical worker were injured. Uh, according uh, to the data uh, World Health Organization, um, one of uh, four Ukrainians uh, at a risk of mental uh, disorder uh, due to conflict. And according uh, to the article of our Ukrainian um, uh, professionals, uh, we expect uh, increased prevalence of substance uh, use uh, disorders. Uh, ITTC Ukraine uh, conducted uh, uh, the study in August 2022 uh, with the purpose of uh, research uh, fix the state at a certain moment uh, of provision of special medical care for people with substance use disorder in Ukraine during the war. Uh, more than uh, 90 documents were selected for analysis. Uh, above 80% uh, uh, of documents were published after the beginning of the Russia war on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, the main consequences uh, of these uh, uh, analyses. Um, closing uh, uh, of healthcare facilities uh, uh, because of fighting, destruction and occupation of territory. Uh, destruction and closure of the pharmaceutical factories that produced uh, methadone. Uh, lack of stocks of drugs uh, in uh, pharmacies. Uh, disruption uh, of supply roads within the country. Uh, the impact uh, of drug shortage of the black market for drugs in Ukraine and increasing prices. Uh, limited access to medical supplies, including methadone and uh, naloxone, or shortage of medicine due to service overload in Western region. Uh, shortage of staff and educational workload for staff and need to evacuate patient and staff. Uh, the situation in Ukraine is very dynamic uh, and change every day. Uh, these were the first consequences. Uh, we paid attention first six months uh, of the war. Uh, then, at the end of uh, 2022, our focus uh, on uh, sudden change uh, in every life uh, and plans, exposure to violence, war-related sexual violence, relocation and separation of loved ones, loss of homes and income, disruption uh, to education. And today uh, our focus is on uh, land miners. Uh, more than 40% uh, uh, of territory of Ukraine is mined. Uh, the occupation of territories, return of prisoner of uh, war, significant uh, damage uh, to the economy, last scale destruction uh, and damage to health care facility. In our study, uh, also we um, analyze service provision for people with substance use disorder during the war. Uh, 
uh, we um, analyze the a situation with internally displaced persons on occupied territories, on abroad, and met in criminal justice um, uh, settings. Um, internally displaced person, uh, 29 uh, healthcare facility from 230 uh, that uh, offered met uh, services closed due to you know, occupation of the territory, destruction, stopping the delivery of drug, lack of medical uh, workers. Um, uh, an increase in number of people with substance use disorder seeking special medical care services in the set, uh, central and uh, western pass, uh, part of Ukraine. Um, the practice of waiting list in the uh, central and west part of Ukraine uh, problems of access to med due to lack of documents among uh, internally displaced persons, uh, reducing the um, dosage of drug due to lack of uh, um, drug, uh, the ideology economy of the drug for these patients, and stopping the activity of some private uh, sites. Uh, the patient uh, from uh, private sites uh, uh, have been registered at a new place uh, of residence. Uh, on occupied territories, uh, due to constant hostility, occupation, damage to infra uh, infrastructure, disruption of logistics, the match program in uh, this territory has been completely stopped. Uh, most patients have left their homes and moved to a safer region. Uh, for people with substance use disorder on abroad, uh, I would like to note uh, only that uh, prohibition for men uh, younger than 40 years to travel abroad. Uh, the problem to uh, accessing medical facility to confirm uh, disability for people with substance use disorder during the war. And uh, it took time to uh, establish cooperation to help such patients abroad. Uh, and uh, uh, criminal justice setting before the war met program uh, in nine criminal justice setting began uh, in Ukraine last uh, open before the war February 22 uh, in temporarily occupied territories closing this program uh, in three penitentiary institutions evacuated to prisoners to region where there was access to met program uh, and the Ministry of uh, Justice continues to implement it met, uh, uh, in facilities located in territory of Ukraine during uh, the war. And now some uh, words about the strategy to better dissemination information and support provision of treatment and recovery services. First of all, uh, simplify admission and uh, operating uh, uh, procedures. Without a referral from a family doctor, patients without uh, documents, temporary permission uh, to not keep electronic medical uh, records and submit report, uh, writing paper prescription along with electronic uh, uh, ones, writing electronic prescription for remote uh, consultation. Uh, structural and uh, organizational change, preparation for uh, deployment of uh, additional beds, uh, reprofiling the department, uh, resumption of work, opening of own kitchen and uh, laundries uh, to reduce uh, the dependence uh, of the institution uh, on outside uh, companies, uh, change in the work of staff, uh, change extension of working hours, uh, rotation between departments, provision of accommodation to staff in a medical institution in case of problems uh, with transportation, provision of food for staff, 
combination of online and offline work with the return of an offline component due to problem with electricity and communication, uh, employment of displaced medical personnel to fill uh, the shortage of uh, staff, uh, financial support for employees who were injured or experienced uh, losses. Uh, next, uh, relocation uh, of uh, medical facilities to other building or temporary of uh, new boarding institution, restoration of uh, mm, premise, medicine and necessary supplies, organizing uh, of uh, bomb shelters with uh, the ability to accommodation uh, patients, their relatives and staff, providing institutions uh, with uh, power station and generators in case of problems with electricity, creating a stock of medicine, uh, essential suppliers, uh, gasoline, organiza uh, organizing uh, humanitarian hubs. Uh, cooperation uh, with volunteers, uh, international uh, foundation, uh, charitable organization and local businesses, providing the institution with the necessary supplies, medicine, helping uh, patients with clothing, uh, uh, hygiene pr uh, products, uh, funding, uh, hosting. And uh, um, we received a lot of help uh, from our NGOs organization. Uh, for example, the NGOs uh, mobile outpatient clinic for the delivery of uh, medication. And uh, um, change uh, uh, a lot of information between uh, the doctors in uh, different region uh, about the patients. And uh, now some words about our prospect. Um, this is our first lady. Uh, she supports uh, uh, the national all Ukrainian uh, program mental health uh, psychosocial support. And uh, um, she supports uh, the organization uh, coordination center un under the cabinet of ministry on Ukraine. And uh, um, now she um, organized a third uh, world forum for First Lady. This forum will in Kiev, Ukraine, September 6. And the first time the topic of this uh, world forum, uh, mental health. And uh, uh, for Ukraine, uh, um, this uh, possibility uh, uh, to attract the attention uh, to the mental health uh, and uh, um, addiction, uh, psychiatry, addiction problem in our country. And uh, uh, also I um, uh, would like uh, to say some words about uh, uh, the program document uh, which uh, uh, preparing uh, now in Ukraine. Uh, this is the Lancet Psychiatry Commission of Mental Health Care in Research in Ukraine. 45 specialists uh, from the world uh, uh, are working uh, uh, now uh, from Europe and from America, Canada, Australia and other countries. Uh, we um, uh, would like um, uh, these uh, um, uh, people uh, divide uh, for five groups and uh, um, you can see uh, exists the group clinical service and uh, we would like uh, to change uh, our um, clinical service for people with uh, substance use uh, disorders and uh, uh, this group uh, discuss uh, uh, now about uh, this uh, topic and we hope to create a new care for our uh, people uh, with uh, uh, based no with a new standard with evidence based intervention and protection uh, for um, people's right and uh, i think um, with uh, support uh, IEDDR uh, and uh, together with uh, network uh, ITTC and uh, ISAP family, we can uh, do it. Thank you very much uh, for attention. Thank you. I, I think we have time for one or two questions, if there are any. 
Don't be shy. Hi, my name is Liesl Jacobs. I'm from Rhodes University in South Africa. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I am just so amazed at the work that you are doing and it's very inspiring and I have no idea how you do what you do under the circumstances that you live in. So I just wanna say, I do see that you are partnering with different universities and I just want to make myself available. If there's anything I can do, I would like to have a discussion with you, but I just, I just wanted to make a comment that the work you're doing is so amazing and please continue to do what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, because it's not easy. It's a really uh, difficult time, but uh, I would like to thank all for uh, help. Uh, without the helping, we couldn't uh, to survive in this situation. Thank you very much. I think it speaks to the power of having consortiums and having the International Technology Transfer Center where there's exchange of information across networks uh, to fill in gaps and provide uh, international support to each other. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pinchuk. Uh, our third speaker, uh, Dr. Goodman Sebeko, is from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, a professor of psychiatry there. For those of you who uh, attended the plenary uh, this afternoon, we heard the importance of quality improvement and engaging uh, uh, the patient experience. And we can't possibly do that unless we know what the communities we serve are wanting and can be partners with them in order to make sure that the education and training that we're doing is relevant to the people we are trying to serve and that will be the topic of Dr. Subeko's presentation. Thank you, Gavin. My slide looks like I feel right now. <clears throat> so if I do collapse from while I'm sitting, it's from jet lag. Please don't post me on social media, rather help me up. <laughs> so I, I beg. So um, I'm just gonna be talking today about engaging uh, stakeholders uh, who serve our communities in South Africa to identify needs um, and develop uh, scalable SUD interventions, which is really what the entire ITTC network is, is about. Uh, so I'm just gonna demonstrate how we've done it in South Africa. So this is my team. Uh, in South Africa today, it's National Women's Day. And so I actually checked the slide and I realized it doesn't reflect that my department actually has a predominance of female uh, academics. So the slide is not representative of my department. So I would like to see it being more female. It's also Shahima's birthday today. She's over there. So, <laughs> so happy birthday to you. So this team um, is um, all very minimally funded by the ITTC to various extents. Uh, Fergus at the bottom um, is our course convener for the postgraduate diploma in addictions care. He receives 10% uh, effort funding from the ITTC. Shahima receives half of her funding from ITTC. She does public mental health work in the rest of her time. Uh, Nurain receives just half a day of funding. Amy doesn't receive any funding from ITTC, but she gives us her time. Warren receives about 40% of her effort, and I uh, get about 10 to 20% at various months to month. So just to demonstrate the fact that um, we try to make the best of what we have. Um, so we're not um, uh, flushed with, with cash, as it were, but it's about being creative about how you use your team's effort and time uh, to meet the deliverables of the ITTC. So we're gonna talk about where we are, talk about what we did, um, and the strategy for responding to the needs we elicited. And I'm just gonna illustrate briefly, oh, I forgot to start my timer. I'm gonna illustrate uh, briefly how we um, uh, have used our collaborations to effect the, um, the interventions we needed. So where are we? We are located at the bottom of Africa, at the tip of Africa in, in Cape Town. 
um, uh, at the University of Cape Town. So it's a beautiful campus that you see in that image. Uh, we are located at Hrutskir Hospital, which you might know is where the first heart transplant was done um, in the world ever. Um, and of course, worth noting, uh, UCT is the top university in Africa as well. Our offices are located here at the Neuroscience Center, uh, which, uh, which comprises a confluence of neurosurgery, psychiatry, general surgery, and addiction psychiatry. So we've got a growing collaborative system there that seeks to really understand um, um, the sort of functional uh, determinants of, of behavior. What do we do as ITTC South Africa? We support development um, and implementation of national and regional drug and alcohol policy. You'll see in my slides later that this uh, work has extended to the continent as well. Um, so we do this um, uh, by, so we developed an, an expert policy framework. I'm sure all of us in the room know, but we don't like uh, acronyms, so I'll spell it out. Screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. So we developed a policy framework for national government. Uh, and are uh, still assisting them work out the kinks for implementing them. I think you all know you, you, can, you can work to the hilt with government, but to actually get things actioned is another headache, which is why I have less and less hair with each passing year. So we're also working on developing uh, interventions for traditional leaders and health, and this is the, uh, the core of the work we do, the African Union. You can't work in the African continent without being responsive to people's proclivity for seeking assistance through the traditional network. So we have to be responsive to that. And we also work with the Provincial Department um, of Health, uh, uh, which has a partnership, a joint management partnership with the University of Cape Town uh, to consider overlapping uh, concerns of public health um, and addiction being a core of them. As you, as you all know, addiction affects the entire spectrum of health. And so through the joint management team, we're able to support the province in reviewing and developing policies and practices uh, to address addiction uh, in a, in a, in a, in a cross-cutting way. Um, the core of what we've always done is capacity building, which really seeks to expand uptake of evidence-based practice. So we have standard motivational interviewing and expert training, which is largely led by Shahima and was co-developed by Rihanna Kadra, who's on the board of ICDDR. We led the Addiction 2021 conference, one of the most successful online conferences um, you know, that during that, because it was one of the first fully online conferences and we had an excellent result. Um, we support uh, provincial substance use treatment system strengthening uh, in various provinces, including KwaZulu-Natal, um, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and Gauteng. Now, I didn't put up a map of South Africa. I didn't want to go too deep into that, but hopefully, this makes sense. Hopefully you have a sense of what South Africa looks like. We also offer the postgraduate diploma of addictions care. Earlier this morning when I was more sane and less jet lagged, uh, I presented an overview of what our department uh, offers in terms of capacity building. So we offer master's programs, PhD, and a postgraduate diploma of addictions care. And we leverage the resources and networks of ITTC to support the PG Dip addictions care. And we also support the Colleges of Medicine, which does resident training. Um, so we've helped them strengthen their substance use curricula and capacity building. So the most um, exciting part of our work, um, you know, uh, Brian Morales likes to say he sees ITCCs as the organizations that have an overview of the circumstances within a country. And in order to do that, we have to assess the barriers for uh, implementation of uh, evidence-based practice and put practices in place to meet um, the gaps to implement them. So um, we do this um, through the resource mapping, which uh, you know follows on the, the, the example set by Vietnam uh, ITTC. Uh, so we're in the process of developing uh, a detailed uh, resource map as well. We've just launched the web app Assist. Uh, and Laurie, after you mentioned it this morning, I realized I maybe should have said more about it in my slides. I didn't think about it. So the Web App Assist tool is meant to plug into all primary uh, uh, social and health assessments across the country starting this year. It's been launched already by our government. That will help us uh, have a passive risk map for the country so that before people even come in uh, for, uh, for help seeking, we're able to elicit levels of risk uh, that they might not be aware of themselves and of course uh, through the joint management team. So those are the core activities of the ITTC. So how did we figure out what needed to be done? Initially we conducted a needs assessment. Um, 
which was formative of the interventions which we then adopted. We then um, selected a national advisory board which provides ongoing feedback. So at the formation of the advisory board, and again, Laurie was there at that meeting many, many years ago, and they continue to provide active, ongoing feedback. Uh, really wonderful advisory board. Um, so the idea is to be responsive um, as well as, uh, as, to, as to sort of as, uh, adopt a cooperative style for implementation. And of course, we've done follow-up needs assessment and continue to review our content iteratively and consultatively. And of course, uh, you know, COVID certainly resulted in some long-lasting changes to how we, we pro provide our training and technical assistance in, in some good ways, actually, because we were forced to take things largely online, as I'm sure most of you were as well. Needs assessment. The stakeholders who responded to our initial needs assessment were largely from the NGO sector, which I think reflects um, some of the sentiment shared by the other partners who've spoken today, that it, in, on the field, it's actually the NGOs who actually effect change and, and, and deliver uh, packages of, of intervention. We did have government response significantly because we wanted to make sure we had buy-in. So it's not because they are the most active, it's because we pushed for that, because we wanted them to feel a part of the process of developing and maintaining the ITTC. So the uh, key uh, staffing uh, burden that, that, that uh, the stakeholders sort of were responsible for was social workers um, and uh, sort of nurses as well as you know, lay counselors, etc. Now this reflects, um, you know, in engaging with our advisory board, it became clear that they felt that that's where the, get the greatest gaps were in terms of uh, capacity building and support. Certainly doctors needed support in terms of detox training and, and training around uh, uh, procedures for opioid substitution, etc. But when it came to screening, uh, detection and early intervention and basic motivational interviewing skills, that was largely the social workers and the non-specialists. So the services rendered by the stakeholders that we um, were able to elicit responses from were largely substance treatment and prevention and mental health treatment and prevention. So I mean, we know the, 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 you know, the, the relationship, the co-occurrence between mental health challenges and substance use disorders. Again, it's something I alluded to in my presentation earlier this morning. Uh, so that, that sort of was borne out in our needs assessment as well. In the follow-up needs assessment, you see that social workers, um, nurses, and other cadres who consisted of home-based carers, managers, policymakers, and psychologists were more represented than doctors. So it was interesting that in the follow-up assessment, um, we, were, we, we elicited that less doctors were identified as needing additional capacity building. What did they need capacity building in? Not surprising, it was around screen, uh, detection, early intervention and treatment. Uh, I think we, we all expected this. So how do we meet the needs that we've elicited? We, as, as you would all know in this room, belong to this network, and so we make uh, the best to, to take advantage of our links with ISAP and ICDDR. We, support, uh, we are supported and support Colombo Plan through um, accessing curricula and, and, and performing curriculum review. Uh, and through processes like the UTC walkthrough, uh, we provide guidance for universities in South Africa about how best they can integrate elements of UTC and in future UPC into their curricula. We do policy development with the African Union as well as with national and provincial governments. I mentioned Af uh, Addiction 2021, which represented a collaboration with SICAD OAS with African Union. And of course, we do capacity building where we support the regional UTC trainers um, and, uh, and of course through the addiction conference, which, which is still alive by the way, um, and other ICDR and ISAP conference settings. So I've mentioned um, that we work closely with ICDDR, um, and earlier on I did present about the uh, UTC walkthrough, which we, which we presented in collaboration with ICDDR South Africa. Um, and so we continue to work with ICDDR. We um, delivered the MI in Africa webinar series in collaboration very gratefully with Steve Rolnick and Bill Miller. They've been wonderful collaborat collaborators in that. We work closely with the Central Drug Authority, the custodians of policy, uh, uh, drug policy in South Africa, and I've mentioned African Union and Colleges of Medicine. What's very exciting for us is this work we're doing with global surgery. So global surgery has a very interesting, overarching, multidisciplinary approach to community engagement. And they've invited us to participate in their community engagement efforts 
to make sure addiction is part of the agenda when they talk about preventive and treatment strategies um, across the board when it comes to trauma, when it comes to cancer and other um, surgery-related issues. Our advisory board is, uh, represents folks who um, have a national um, footprint, so from national government to national organizations mandated to drive policy implementation of strategies. And so through, that, through those collaborations, we're able to have sustainability and reach in our interventions. So it's a really active, it's actually a wonderful advisory board. And I look forward to our next meeting in September. It's always wonderful to engage with them. So this slide um, it just highlights in the last uh, 90 seconds the, some of the work that we've done with these major partners. So with the National Department of Health, we've done this with policy framework. We've contributed and continue to contribute to the National Foundation Phase Curriculum for non-specialist workers in South Africa. We've worked with the National Department of Correctional Services. We're speaking about ATI, so we, that's something that we're busy working on. Uh, but we've provided expert capacity building and created a surveillance collaboration with them, which is super exciting. Uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, we're busy continuing with rollout of uh, cascading expert training and setting up an addiction center of excellence, which is also very exciting. And of course, with the Department of Social Development and the Central Drug Authority, we continue to, pr to produce the addiction conference, support the UTC master trainers, and continuing uh, with the community level engagement in partnership with the global surgery team. So in summary, our technical assistance um, impacts nationally, provincially, and continentally. Our capacity building and linked research has an impact at the same levels. Our network development has seen us work closely nationally with South African Medical Research Council and National Department of Social Development with the AUC on the continental level, African Union as well as, of course, our partners, ISAP, ICDDR, and um, CPDAP. And of course, I've mentioned the policy development. Um, so this slide, again, reflects my, it looks much better in the Dropbox, I promise you. So there's a few texts that are missing here, but that's me. Thank you. Open it up for questions for Dr. Sebeko. Be nice. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sally from Indonesia. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's really comprehensive. It's just like a dream team that you have. Uh, can you tell me further about the program? Do you have a non-degree program for training in, in your place? I'm sorry, a non? Non-degree program. Oh, non-degree. Oh. Uh, or the continuing education for, for example, for medical doctor, um, and is this training improve their competency? Because in our uh, Ministry of Health and from the Collegium in in our uh, center, uh, for example, medical doctor for handling drug addiction, as the doctor sister present uh, this morning. Uh, for emergency, uh, emergency in, uh, in handling emergency problem in drug users, they only have, uh, they only allow, they only be allowed to handle emergency problem. And it's for a short time, and then they have to refer it to other uh, higher facility. So if they have this training program, will they improve their skill or not? They get additional skill or not? And who are the participate? Uh, who are the participants of your training program? It's come from all of the institutions that you mentioned, or it's just open and funded by themselves. Thank you. Gosh, I'm very tempted to take the mic to my colleagues here, but I'm going to spare them. But um, I think they would do an excellent job of answering this question. Um, in terms of the University of Cape Town, uh, we don't offer non-degree. And I think it's part of the limitations that we want to address. Uh, so we just have the postgrad diploma in addictions care. Um, there's another part division that provides a different diploma. We also have the MPhil and we also have the PhD. So we don't... Uh, that was the alarm for me to stop talking. So we don't provide um, 
sort of non-degree, but what we do provide through the ITCC is training and motivational interviewing, training uh, through our partners in detox um, and OST. Uh, so we would normally pull in other collaborators to assist medical practitioners uh, sort of with that kind of training and training in screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. When we did a study in KZN, which I actually didn't include in these slides, um, overwhelmingly, providers who had attended our SBIRT and MI trainings responded that it had improved their practice. So not only had they, did they feel more competent, because they now had some basic skills in terms of how to actually manage somebody with substance use disorders, they felt that they were actually performing those uh, more capably as well. And that was reflecting in terms of the indicators provincially and nationally for, for referral. So at the moment, as we roll out the ASSIST tool, we're, we're hoping that that will also begin to be reflected within uh, the indicators. So part of the input that we do as ITTC is uh, systems review input. The indicators that our government uses to monitor uh, uh, detection and, and management practices are actually completely ins insufficient. So they indicate that somebody has been screened or that somebody has been referred, but it doesn't indicate what sort of interventions taken place, what level of risk they were at, and what substances were considered. So in order for us to meaningfully actually comment on the impact of teaching and capacity building, we also need to then tackle the, uh, the, the, the indicators from that side as well. So the short answer is no, uh, not, not specifically for medical doctors, but the resources we do have, medical doctors can access and they do and they report improved uh, uh, capacity after accessing them. Any other questions for Dr. Sebeko? Thank you very much uh, for a very nice uh, presentation. I would like to ask you about cooperation, coordination between um, university and uh, um, NGOs and governmental organizations which provide educational program for our specialists. Uh, NGOs, uh, very mobile, modern, have a financial and uh, uh, can uh, offer our doctors, nurses, a modern uh, evidence-based program. Uh, change uh, the educational program in university very difficult. And uh, I think uh, in our country, the university, uh, the second step, uh, NGO before the university. Uh, exists the problem in you in how we coordinate, uh, cooperate with NGOs? So that's very interesting. We we find that we, we are the resource for capacitating NGOs as well, which is why Shahima has sleepless nights um, along with the rest of my team, because we actually can't meet the demand. You know, it's part of why I was, I was mentioning the, the relative efforts of each of the team members, because we're so stretched, we actually can't meet the demand. So in, in South Africa, the NGO sector are more service providers, and they plug the hole that uh, government uh, service providers can't, can't fill. So the, the other partners who provide capacity building would be in the private sector. So Rihanna and Shami, these would be people like um, SACAP and people like uh, Foundation for Professional Development, etc. cetera. Um, but they don't plug the, the areas that, that remain as a gap. So that's a serious concern for us, is that the formal training sector actually then retains a responsibility to also support the informal sector's capacity building. Just before COVID, we had a beautiful structure set up where we were partnering with uh, Orem Institute, a, a non-governmental organization in South Africa, to provide uh, trainer training, uh, master training to them so that they could have the capacity to assist us in meeting the load. But then COVID came and NGOs were rerouted to respond to COVID. And so we haven't been able to go back on that. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem in South Africa is that the burden still rests um, on the higher education sector. Having said that, there are various levels of um, teaching within the higher education sector. You know, we have technical colleges, we have universities, we have what we used to call uh, technicons. So university would be the highest level. So we do offer various levels of, of postgraduate teaching at those levels. And I think part of what we need to do as ICDR South Africa is look at how we support um, the stratification of the provision of training 
so that the burden is shared across the network and not just at the university level. So that's the, that's the challenge we have. So the NGO sector for us is not a, a strong supporter in terms of capacity building. They're they capacity receivers. Thank you, Dr. Sabako. So our fourth speaker representing the fourth ITTC for this session is Dr. Riza uh, Sarah. It's incredibly important for the universities to establish relationships with government. And so that is what our final presentation will cover. Thank you, Dr. Barb. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the last presenter, but not the least, hopefully. Uh, the previous presenters are all from the universities. I'm the only one from the policy maker. I think this is the how we balance the symposium to be to be fair from the point of view of the police policy policy maker. So I would like to present the collab collaborative works between the university network and the government efforts to identify substance use needs and service gaps in Indonesia. Yeah. I think uh, this slide will uh, have been shown by by Dr. Sister previously, the prevalence of drug abuse increased from 1.8% in 2019 to become 1.95%. This is slightly, slightly increased, but in terms of the nominal, it's about 3 million of our people. And this one happened in during the pandemic. So usually they buy it by from the e-commerce particularly the NPS, new psychoactive substances, uh, uh, in spe specifically uh, cannabis, synthetic cannabinoid. So Indonesian population age 15 to 64, four, four, six, 64 years old have ever used about, uh, this is about numbers, I'm become slurred because of the numbers can we just skip it? You can see it clearly. Then hearing my my speech, and then so th uh, this is some notes uh, from me as a policy maker. Uh, the Indonesia Narcotic National Narcotics Board focus on prevention and community empowerment in rural areas that might contribute to a better prevalence compared to urban areas because in the previous slide you can see here uh, in the rural rural areas uh, it's only as uh, this is a slightly uh, decrease but not in the urban areas so this might be contributed by the efforts that we together with the universities as well as the NGO uh, put in the areas of the urban, uh, oh, sorry, of the rural, such as family strengthened program, working together with the family. This is supported by the UNODC, and also life skill training. Self, self. This is the National Narcotic Board uh, funding, and then also develop a community-based intervention called as a. IBM or intervention based, community based, as a low threshold treatment intervention, particularly modeling a SBIRT approach, empowering, in quote, train local people to be able to identify drug user, early and simple intervention using motivational interviewing, and using the power of local ladies or housewives. We call it in Indonesia if the power of mama. If you know, uh, if you understand the, the uh, Indonesian language or the Malayu, Malay language, the power of mama means that housewives have a strong power 
to push not no, to uh, to to mobilize the people who use drugs to come into the intervention program and then I, this is again the numbers i would like to skip this if um, you if you are okay with this Okay, the, the, the last one. The first usage commonly occur with age of 30 to 40, with the first type of drug being used mainly were cannabis, uh, around 50%, and then crystal methamphetamine, ecstasy, amphetamine, dexo, dexamphetamine, adrenal, and so on. And the last one is benzodiazepine. I think we need also uh, to put here, but it is not yet as an official uh, coming up to the from the surveillance is the new sector of the substances. So one of the division, one division of our institution in the National Narcotic Board is a, a community empowerment division. They they do the mapping for the drug prone areas all over Indonesia and it is it was restarted about more than 180 areas of the drug prone areas and we we set up a program of drugs free Indonesia it doesn't mean to freeing Indonesia totally from drugs because it is impossible but at least there are some some program and some efforts to reduce as much as possible drug abuse the first one is the community empowerment we do the alternative empowerment doing mapping life skill training and then also community participation through capacity building anti-drug activist training and urine test for screening and for rehabilitation, I already mentioned before, we develop community-based intervention unit, and then we power, we empower and train local people as a recovery agent, or we, we are known as a, more as a recovery coach. And then for the prevention, we do the drug-free village, and then develop anti-drug volunteers and strengthen the communication, information, and education, including the family. Strengthen the family. And for the eradication, we do the information on drug abuse and illicit trafficking, uh, activities to support security and order, and area supervision. Uh, some notes from, the, from us, from our institution, with one main strategies of cooperation with various stakeholders, including higher education, collaboration includes the first one, development of internship program for medical student or addiction specialist program, as well as for the psychologist, and then development of master or non-degree in addiction program in medicine and psychology. The second one is implementation of training and education program, including general lecture, the last one is collaborative studies or research in prevention and or, and or treatment. Collaboration so far is along with the University of Indonesia that mentioned by before, previously by Dr. Sister and then Pajajaran University, Bandung, 2009, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Shelley? Oh, 2016. Oh, I'm sorry. Again, numbers. <laughs> Wijaya Kusuman University in Surabaya is is Java. Mataram University. I think all over Indonesia, we already collaborate about the training and as well as the education in addiction field, including the the training for the nurse before we are getting before we are getting a complaint from the nurse as well uh, as before in the previous uh, session Indonesia bersinar or drug free Indonesia 
is a president, presidential policy to reduce drug abuse in community started in a village or educational setting in 2022 we developed the drug fee village in 558 villages this is only 8% of all villages in Indonesia as a big country so it is a lot of things to do involve an integrated program consists of prevention, community empowerment, and rehabilitation. And then the second one is the educational institution base, establishment of the uh, drug-free campus or school, including Padang State University, and so forth. Activities including a curriculum integration, drug, ta drug task force for early detection and simple intervention. And the last one is community-based. Uh, uh, I want to recall that previously uh, to Dr. Sorry, I forgot the name. Sibeko, there is an uh, there is a question about the role of the NGO. Uh, for in this matter, we work closely to the with the one NGO named Ikai in the last stem. It means the Indonesia Addiction Counselor. The Indonesia Addiction Counselor Association is very active to initiate uh, of the addiction counselor to be able and to be acknowledged by the government as uh, one of the professionals. And now it's already being acknowledged in Indonesia in all of the setting of the government. So they have a rank, they, they can also reach a particular rank if they are uh, hired as a civil servant. This is only the, to describe the uh, drug-free campus. It's a program implemented it at the higher education level, such as universities, academic institutes, polytechnics, and high schools, with massive imp implementation of prevention er and eradication of drug abuse and trafficking program. There are three criteria for campus vicinal. The first one is there are policies or regulations from rector or dean. The se second one is carry out prevention activities, such as early detection and intervent intervention and then the formation of anti-drug volunteers. Campus Bersinar or drug-free campuses declaration is one of the commitments of the academic community in preventing and minimizing drug abuse in Indonesia, particularly among students. I think we already, I already mentioned about this before previously. This is only an additional uh, information that there are particular uh, memorandum of understanding between our institution with the University of Indonesia. I think I think that's all of my presentation. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Dr. Sarasvita? Hey, well, thank you. Oh, we do have a question. Thank you. Uh. Hello, everyone. I'm T. Halim from Myanmar. So I have only one question on you. So uh, what is the role of that anti-drug use volunteer? Because in, in our country, in some movement, there, there was a, some movement that anti dry use volunteer, but the, because of their nature and based on their leader, their, their, their role is quite different from, in some area, their role is just to educate and to do, but in some area, they have some kind of arresting and to, to the dry use, all these things. So in here, I would like to know the 
role of that antivirus volunteer? If I'm not misunderstanding your question, you are asking about the clear role of the anti-drugs volunteers, right? Uh, in our situation, anti-drug volunteers um, have to be a good role model for the community that they are not using drugs, that the first one. And the second one, they can also be our our agent in the community to educate and also to to give the information to the community about the dangers of drugs so they don't then don't have any authority to arrest people thank you Dr. Lisa, so this isn't a question, but just a reflection and comment. Uh, I think the importance of policy and government and being in, um, in terms of implementation. So unlike in South Africa, the government is very proactive and the NGO. So Dr. Lisa, I just wanted to say that last year when we conducted the training on recovery and Indonesia was so proactive, we focused a lot on treatment and Indonesia rolled out the recovery training program, um, which was quite successful, and they had trainers from all over the provinces in Indonesia. Yeah, because when started the COVID based intervention program, a lot of people, including the family, the community, the community and also the law enforcement agencies, uh, put in doubt on our efforts. They thought that it is not going to work. So we do, we put the study for the, to prove that it works, although it is only run by the lay person, lay but trained person. So we, we thought that at that time that it is important for them to be, to be certified. That's why we work together with the DAP, Colombo Plan, to, to train the people who are working with the recovery agent or recovery coach so now we are in the in the step of uh, of certifying the recovery ag uh, coach so in the future the recovery coach could be uh, uh, what do you call it? because they they work without any payment so how can we uh, ensure the sustainability it's not easy that's why we put them and then we try to put them as a really professionals uh, to, to raise them, to raise their self-esteem at least because they work freely and voluntarily. Thank you, Rihanna, for reminding me. We have another question. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. There is a point that called me my attention. Are you conducting drug testing at the universities? Yeah. Uh, drug testing. Drug testing in, uh, uh, drug testing universi in university depends on the on the university themselves. We as a, a leading institution of narcotics board. We are not uh, policing. Uh, we are not forcing them to do the drug testing university for the screening. But for the screening, it depends. We put, we give it back to the university whether they want to do it or not. Probably my colleagues will uh, can also answer about this from the university. This is from the point of view of policymaker. Uh, yeah, let, let me answer that. That is, that is one of the things that is clearly stated in the international standard of quality that uh, may have a, a opposite result instead of prevention. So that's one of the things that is yes, was a curiosity for me. If I'm not mistaken, some of the universities applied drug screening 
uh, as a requirement to enter the university some of them but not all of the universities thank you uh, oh yeah oh okay in my university uh, some of university that uh, burisa said uh, doing uh, urine drug test before the students uh, come to the university thank you um so certainly we've learned that universities are absolutely critical to education, but that they don't function in vacuums. If you're going to train people, it's important to find out, did you train them in what they want to learn? And what do, uh, and how can you alter curriculum to address what they do want to learn as, as we heard in Vietnam with the needs assessments and evaluating a newly developed workforce when one never existed before 2008. Universities have to adapt to their circumstances. Uh, the unfortunate war situation in Ukraine, uh, having to adapt to uh, a scattered population to meet new needs, to train a new workforce, to deal with what will assuredly be a massive uh, mental health and substance use crisis. Uh, there. Uh, universities train people who go out into the world and South Africa has partnered with many community organizations in a very complex way with uh, many partners involved whether it's at the continental level of uh, African Union or addressing national politics or or even uh, township uh, hyper local needs uh, to find out what community organizations are requiring and then finally we heard about how government plays a role in setting policy and can help implement or create new pathways for training such as the recovery um, uh, uh, training and different degree programs so I hope everyone found this uh, a valuable uh, session that ties into so much of what we've already heard today uh, if you did, or even if you did not find this a valuable session, please let us know. There is a QR code. There's QR codes uh, to provide evaluations of all the sessions. So as we heard from the plenary, we can be engaged in constant quality improvement. So the next conference uh, will be better still. You make sure, so it. we have two minutes left. Uh, a plug we heard great speakers here today but not everyone could fit to be a speaker in this conference and so there are many people who created uh, poster presentations that will be just down the hall with the reception and posters and I must say as as many of you know a lot of the posters are created by students so our our, our very audience of who we deal with in university so please go support uh, and engage in the students because they are our future workforce. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to a great day tomorrow. <laughs>